Welcome to the Make a Mental Note podcast, where mental health professionals share information and perspectives that illuminate, educate, and is worthy of a mental note. And now your host, Chris Quarto. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining me on this week's episode of the Make a Mental Note podcast. I'm Chris Quarto. My mental health tip of the week has to do with improving impulse control. Have you ever done or said things without thinking about it? And then you think to yourself later, what was I thinking? Sometimes our impulses get the best of us and create problems in our relationships and other ways. Have you ever heard of the counting to 10 strategy when you feel the impulse to do something? There's really something to this. Psychologists know that if you interrupt your typical pattern of behavior, you're less likely to enact the pattern at that point in time. And counting to 10, when you feel the impulse to do something, is just one example of interrupting the pattern. I mean, you could get really creative if you wanted to. You could recite the alphabet. You could sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star or do a bunch of jumping jacks. And, you know, of course, you might need to do these things in your own head if you're around a group of people. Otherwise, they might... (laughs) wonder about you. And the idea is to make it a goal to do something that'll that'll interrupt your normal pattern of impulsive responding in a specific situation. So think of something that you might do sort of impulsively that you'd like to work on this week and give this a try and see how it works. So that's my mental health tip of the week. Okay, my guest this week is Lori Van, who's going to be talking about non-suicidal self-injury. You know, I've been waiting a long time to talk to an expert about this issue, and I'm so glad that Lori agreed to be part of the Make a Mental Note podcast. So, here's Lori. Welcome again, everyone, to the Make, Make a Mental Note podcast. I'm Chris Quarto. And I'm joined today by Lori Van, who is a licensed professional counselor in the great state of Texas. And Lori, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Well, if you wouldn't mind, tell the mental note takers a little bit about uh, who you are and what type of work that you do. Well, I wear many different hats in my private practice in North Texas. All right. So um, I'm primarily a licensed professional counselor, supervisor, but I'm also a professional speaker, author, and media consultant. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, you do wear a lot of different hats, don't you? You you obviously stay very busy in what you do. Yes, uh, but I enjoy it because all of the things blend so beautifully because Uh, It's just like when I was a professor and also a counselor that students could bring me questions and then I could tie in the professional part of, well, yes, I've had cases like this. Ah. And then sometimes in going over the introductory psychology stuff, it reminds me of things that I've maybe forgotten over the years and I can bring that back into a therapy session of, hey, just as a FYI, this is what's going on on a very basic level. Very cool. Okay. Well, Lori, how did you get involved uh, in the mental health field? I mean, what made you decide that this was the field for me? And then uh, how did you decide that you were going to branch out and do professional speaking and all that kind of good stuff? Well, I was one of those few cases that had an idea of what I was going to do professionally when I was fairly young. Uh So in sixth grade, uh, the the ripe old age of probably 12, (laughs) A lot of my friends would come to me with different types of problems, and I just seemed to have this knack for helping them out. Okay. And they just seemed to always seek me out. And uh, and I got to about eighth grade and re- started to resist it and go, it just can't be this easy. I cannot possibly know what I want to do for the rest of my life this young. And took a vocational test, and I think I put on there, I'd, I'd want to be a radio DJ or, or other things, and the test came back of, no, nope, counselor. That's, uh-huh. that's what you're supposed to be, counselor and a teacher. Okay. But it, I have been able to get into the radio and television field just because that's the media consulting piece. Right. And also the public speaking. But um, no, I've I've always been fascinated by psychology and have always had a, a deep ingrained belief that you help others, that if you've been given gifts, that you are to use them. And 
one of the reasons I opened my intern office back in, I think, in 2010, is I believe that mental health should not be a luxury item. Mm. That if people want mental health care, that they should be able to get good quality, ethical, professional mental health care at a very affordable price. Uh Uh-huh. Well, so tell us a little bit about what types of services that you offer, Lori. Well, of course, offer the individual counseling, family counseling. I have uh, counselors in my practice that will do the couples uh, counseling part of it because, right. you know, for them, that, uh, that's, those are some tough cases. Yes. And then we also do group counseling and uh, the groups that we offer, and it's my area of expertise, and subsequently the counselors under my supervision are trained in this as well, mm-hmm. is non-suicidal self-injury. All right. We run the only uh, self-injury support groups in all of North Texas for teen girls, for women that self-harm, for the uh, caregivers of those that harm so that they have a place to vent and ask questions. And, and these groups are really, truly unique groups that, um, I mean, I, I started them in about 2009 and that was after years and years of people begging me, where are the groups? Why don't you start a group? And oh. I was working for a mental health company, and I just didn't have that kind of time and flexibility to take it on until I went into private practice. So uh, that notion of non-suicidal self-injury, some of the uh, mental note-takers might not be aware of what that is. They, they may have heard of uh Suicide before and and that kind of thing, but what tell us a little bit more about non suicidal self injury, Lori? Well, it's been called a lot of different names. When it was first discussed, it was called self mutilation, mm-hmm. and that was by Dr. Favazzo, and and obviously that's a real jarring term, mutilation. Yeah. And so over the years, it's taken on different forms from self abuse, self harm. Uh, Some people generalize and call it cutting, which is really inaccurate because self-injury is so much more than just cutting. All right. In my first book, A Caregiver's Guide to Self-Injury, I identify, I want to say it's like 17 different types of self-harm that are out there. Mm -hmm. It's just people get caught up on the one, and and that's one of my little pet peeves because there are a lot of books out there that just say, help your kid with cutting, and like it shows you really don't understand. Right the nature of it, but it, and it's not a suicide attempt, and that's a real important key uh, to focus on because so many people go, well, but they cut on their wrist. That looks like a suicide right. attempt. You have to ask the intent. It's so critical to ask what the intent mm. was behind the injury mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because that makes a difference of do they need to go to the emergency room because it's actual suicide attempt, or is this something that really needs to be dealt with in individual or group counseling? Well, I'm going to ask you the question that a lot of people probably ask, and that is why do people harm themselves in these ways? But before we even get to that question, tell us a little bit about how um, people actually will will hurt themselves. Um, You had mentioned cutting, but there are other ways, aren't there? Yes, there are numerous ways. And it's not unusual for people to start off with one method and then escalate into another or to just try different ones to see what works. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes people might start in elementary school, and that's a real shock for people. I have I've spoken to so many parents that call up and they go, oh, I just discovered my kid is, you know, cutting, that they're injuring. And and in my mind, I'm going, yeah, but I bet this isn't their first time. And I bet that they started off back when they were 10 years of age wow. doing minor things. You just didn't know what to look for. Uh-huh. And that's one of the things I really wanted to drive home in that first book I wrote is you can't make these assumptions that, oh, well, just because I'm not seeing it doesn't mean it's not there. Right. So in elementary school, it may start off with picking or scratching mm-hmm. or doing eraser burns, uh, hitting themselves or using objects to hit themselves. Uh, it could be hitting an object really hard. And again, it's all about that intent. Uh-huh. 
people will also do burns of various types, whether that's a chemical burn or a heating element. And people will also, uh, I mean, go to the limit of even breaking their bones as part of it. Wow. And on the very severe, more psychotic or drug-induced cases, they may actually, um, how to put it gently, uh, remove body parts. Okay. Wow. That's that's amazing. So, so there is um, there can be a progression of how people harm themselves. And I guess some thing that comes to mind for me is that there seem to be some parallels to maybe drug abuse. How you could start off with something uh, that's milder and then generally progress. Is is that an accurate way of kind of looking at that, Lori? That 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 kind of a process. Yes, and actually in the second book I wrote, The Practitioner's Guide to the Treatment of Self-Injury, I spend all of Chapter 3, and it's a big chapter, talking about the parallels between substance abuse Mm. and, well, addiction in general and Mm self-injury. And I think you can apply the same guideline even with the eating disorder, but oftentimes you start off sort of experimenting, sort of curious, and for some people it, it takes, as it were, And for other people, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people experiment, and they do a few times. They go, you know what? Not for me. Not doing anything for me. Mm -hmm. And then other times, it'll be, wow, this is a relief. I'm getting that rush. I get that high. I get that emotional dumping of what's going on. And all these 35-plus reasons why people self-harm. And that's what I've tallied since I started to document and research this in probably about 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And there really are over 35 reasons that I've tallied. And every time someone injures, it could be for a different reason. Mm -hmm. It could be for multiple reasons, or it could just be for a singular reason. And again, that's where you have to really ask them, what was your intent? What was behind this? What was going on in that moment? Um, But I do use a lot of addiction terminology, such as trigger Uh and relapse. Mm -hmm. Because they're appropriate. And my experience has been is that the majority, a lot of those self-injurers report that they feel it's an addiction. They use the term themselves. They feel that they are to it. Wow. And that they do build a tolerance. Mm -hmm. Just like you would with a substance. That you have to go deeper. You have to go longer. You have to go more intense. Because they start to actually build a physiological numbness to some of the pain. Hmm. And I wonder if over the course of time they lose control um, over that over that compulsion, you know, feeling a need to do it and not feeling as though they have control over what they're doing. Yes, and, and that would be another parallel to the substance abuse world is that just like someone that is addicted to alcohol, they can't stop with one drink. They feel this need to just keep going because they feel satiated somehow Mm -hmm. or they pass out. And with self-injury, I've had those cases where they just felt the need to just keep harming until there was some mental line for them, until they felt like they had done it enough, till they felt like, oh, I'm bleeding too much or, oh, this is really serious. I need to take care of this wound in some way, but they really can just keep escalating it and the sense of it's not enough, I need to do a little bit more, and that's contingent sometimes on the trigger. Mm. Have you had any clients, Lori, that have um, gotten to this point of, of getting into it so deeply, and I don't mean that as a pun, but just getting into the cutting or what the self-harm so deeply that they have accidentally uh, killed themselves? Or have you heard of cases like that? I think it's quite feasible, but I think a lot of times those would be ruled as suicides because Uh you're not able to speak to the person at that time to find out their intent. Right. Um, Now, there are plenty of cases, and uh, and this, again, goes to why you must ask intent, is that self-injury is the preventative to a suicide attempt. In Mm. other words, if they did not self-harm, they would attempt suicide. Ah, I see. Okay. 
So if you look at uh, kind of getting back to the question I, I wanted to ask you earlier, and I'm sure everybody's wondering, well, why is it that people do this? What are some of the more common reasons, Lori, that you found uh, when you've done the tallies? And w- what are some of the more common reasons why people harm themselves? Probably the number one is going to be that the emotional pain is so bad that they just don't know what to do with all of those feelings, all of those intense emotions. And so the physical pain is the escape. It's the purge. It's the, the, it, it's easier to deal with. The uh-huh. physical pain is easier to cope with than the emotional. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, um, so you have these people who have these feelings and I wonder if, um, if you look at their backgrounds, uh, their, their, whether it's their childhoods or their particular experiences, have you found that there are certain uh, patterns or themes in the backgrounds of these people? And I'm, I'm kind of thinking, do you find that there are more people who have trauma backgrounds who engage in this or, or not necessarily? Well, there are a couple of things because I do take a look at history of physical abuse, which would also go into neglect, Mm -hmm. sexual abuse, and emotional abuse, which in that I add bullying. Ah. By far, and the last time I did the tally, and it's been several months now, uh, about 70%, a minimum of 70, sometimes a little higher than 70, have a history of emotional abuse. Hmm. And that seems to be one of the big indicators or possible predictors. Mm-hmm. Physical abuse is definitely there, but it's not a majority of the cases. It's not over 50%, at least for uh, outpatient clinical population that I work with. Mm-hmm. And sexual abuse probably runs about the 30 percentile. Okay. Now, those numbers might be different for an inpatient setting, but Many of my clients have a history of being inpatient, of going to the hospital. Right. So I, I think my demographic is somewhat um, representative of the population because I have plenty of adults. I have males. I have females. I have all different racial groups. Um, so I think that it can it's probably pretty representative of what's out there. Mm-hmm. Of course, whenever you look at any real special population, the numbers are going to get skewed a little. If you just look inpatient, those numbers will be skewed compared to outpatient. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, it, you know, it reminds me of, um, as you were talking about who this affects or who's affected by this or who engages in these things, uh, you know, when you look at something like alcoholism, you know, you, you think about that, you hear about this as sort of being like an equal opportunity disorder. Um, and it sounds like with, with uh, non-suicidal self-injury, it doesn't discriminate by, by class, by racial makeup. I mean, this can happen to anybody, can it? Absolutely. Now, are there things that may put them in a certain direction? Sure. Um, mm-hmm. I have seen where, and some of the research with the SAFE program, they had talked about it back in the 90s, I think, when they wrote that book, of that you are more at risk if you have a parent that is an alcoholic or a parent that's a heavy drinker. Well, that makes sense because you're going to have emotional abuse and neglect in those situations. Mm -hmm. Plus, what's being role modeled is, hey, if you have a problem, go to something outside of yourself to deal with it. Go to an escape method. So you had a bad day at work, you grab your bourbon or your vodka or whatever. Mm -hmm. So had a bad day at school, grab a blade, grab the... Uh, the pillow that, you know, you hit against the wall, mm-hmm. grab the, the bat, I mean, just whatever it might yeah. be. And so there's, there's that factor. Um, but, yeah, it, it definitely can build. And mm-hmm. anything you do regularly, you start to form those neural pathways, and it gets more and more ingrained. Yeah, and those uh, you may be familiar with uh, this uh, the study. It was the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study that was done uh, many years ago in, in California, where they uh, followed uh, about seventeen, eighteen thousand people um, from 
uh, from the time that they were young and uh, followed them. And they, they found that there were certain predictors of mental health issue, issues later on in life. Some of these things being what you had mentioned about growing up in an emotionally abusive household and, and physically abusive household. I'm, I'm not sure if bullying was part of that, but I could certainly see how that would figure into it for many people. So I think that, um, you know, for the people who are listening to this podcast, if you're a if you're a graduate student or mental health practitioner and you're listening to this podcast and you're hearing Lori talk about this, you know, the importance of taking a, a developmental history to find out what was the family like and uh, what kind of experiences that did you have that may have set you up for um, these types of experiences later on in life, including non-suicidal self-injury. So, Lori, as you work with these clients, I mean, so, so how do you help them? I mean, they're coming in, probably referred to you because I, I imagine they're depressed, but they're also engaging in these behaviors. So how do you get them from the point where they're initially doing these types of things to the point where perhaps they're not feeling depressed and they're not engaging in these things any longer or at least as often as they had been doing? Well, it's a couple of different things. And one of the key uh, things I see in the majority of clients, regardless of self-injury history, is that most clients struggle with boundary issues. Mm. And it's either because they didn't have it properly role modeled for them, so they don't know how to be assertive Uh appropriately. They don't believe they have certain rights, such as, well, I have the right to make a mistake. comes up a lot with my perfectionist population. Uh Or... Uh, again, if there was substance use in the home, they might have been told, well, you can't make a mistake because then alcoholic parents going to yell at you or you get beat. Yeah. And would make a note on the trauma part, you really have to extend the definition of trauma. And I think that should include things of divorce when a child is young. Uh-huh. Because that's traumatic. Um, you have to include death of loved ones. Uh, maybe they were close to that grandparent, and that was their one connection. Right. And sometimes really serious breakups can be traumatic. So you really have to, I think, broaden that definition versus what we stereotypically think of as trauma of car wreck or witnessing someone being killed or having our life in danger in some manner. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just sort of notes on that, uh, that, sorry, I sort of blanked on what the original question was. Well, you know, it, it, well, but as you were talking about this, I was thinking that um, it, it's got to be different, difficult for a client coming in and this thing that they've been doing to harm themselves has been serving a purpose for them, right? I mean, it's been serving in their minds, it's probably been serving a positive purpose because for emotional relief or as a method of distraction, and so is it the goal to get them to stop doing this? I mean, what, what is the goal when you work with these types of clients? I think you have to start off and find out how motivated they are to work on the self-injury. Yeah. Uh-huh. They even acknowledge it's a problem. Because if you go in guns blazing, as it were, saying, you have to stop it, you can't do this, you will lose the connection with them and they will tune you out. And that's the mistake I've seen so many counselors make. Ah. And why so many clients have transferred to me from other counselors is because the counselor either freaked out or they really didn't understand self-injury or they made these ultimatums just like their parents do of you have to stop, just stop doing it. Well, if it were that easy, don't you think they would have done it? <laughs> that's a very good point. Yeah. I mean, it's, I sort of joke with them, and that's part of my therapy is I build that rapport with them, and I'm really laid back. Uh-huh. And so I find ways to sort of lessen the tension. You know, I make some jokes, and I can get them to smile some and say, you know, it's I'm in your corner. I understand why you're doing this. I'm not passing any judgment on yeah. you. I'm not freaked out by this at all. There's not a lot you can tell me that's going to make me go, ooh, you know, wow, shocking. Mm. But if they're not ready to work on it, then I just go through more of a back door and go, well, let's just look at the reasons why you're doing it. Let's look at these boundary issues. Let's look at these Bill of Rights. Let's look at just how you cope in general. And we may not directly talk about the self-injury because 
it's important to note that's their security blanket. Mm -hmm. That's what they hold on to. Right. When counselors come in and say, well, you just have to stop doing it. You're yanking that blanket from them. And if they don't have other alternatives they've really taken in and they've practiced and they're comfortable with, you've just put them at an increased risk for a suicide attempt. Ah. Yeah. And so don't, wouldn't you agree, Lori, that it's important for a counselor to understand why does this serve as a security blanket? What, what function is this serving for them? I mean, isn't that a real important thing to find out? It is. And it, but then again, why do people choose certain drugs? Why do people yeah. choose alcohol or eating disorder or gambling? It, I don't know if there's necessarily a rhyme or reason as to why some people go with injury and other people go with pills. Uh-huh. It's a lot about the, and I would say that in a lot of cases, not 100%, some of it's the control issue. Mm-hmm. That I can't control the chaos around my world. I don't get to call the shots, but what I do to my body, I've got 100% control over that. And that's also a core issue with eating disorders. Ah. And with eating disorders, you can get that rush, that high, just like you can in self-injury. Mm-hmm. But you're using the body to deal with the emotional issues. Mm-hmm. It's and it's in their mind, they're not really consciously thinking of all of this stuff, but that's what's going on is I can't articulate my thoughts, I can't talk to my bully, I can't tell my parent how upset I am with their substance use, but I'm going to try and work out all these emotions through use of my body. Right. And there's, there's a lot more detail I go into that in the two books to to better understand it, such as the parallels with eating disorders and self-injury, because those have a a nice little correlation there. Okay. There's at least five different things they have in common, and that's why it's not uncommon to see one and the other one pops up and they'll flip-flop. Oh, wow. And so you get to those core issues and help them have a voice, help them feel more in control, help them not take on other people's problems when it's not their stuff. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's what I was going to ask you next, because when we first started talking about, you know, how do you help a person? You said, well, they have to be willing uh, to be helped to begin with. So it kind of reminds me of the, um, you know, the stages of change model where a person has to be ready to kind of go through this uh, before you can help them. But let's say that they decided, okay, yes, I'm, uh, this is something I've been doing. I know it's not good for me and I just, I don't want to do this anymore. So what are some of the techniques or strategies? How, how would you help a person, um, with this type of a problem, Lori? Well, I do give them different handouts. I'm not big on recommending books because most people don't have the time, focus, motivation to follow through with reading it. Okay. So I think of my therapy as a little bit like Cliff Notes version of we're going to talk about all the different things, but here's the handout to help summarize it. All right. To remind you of the things, and then they can make their own little binder of handouts. And that way, when they're done with me and counseling, if a problem comes up again, they've got the handouts. They have something to refer back to. Mm -hmm. Because my goal is not to have a client keep coming back in. My goal is I want them to learn it and I want them to move on. Sure. Um, And I know there there's some out there that go, yeah, but you know that's the the financial part. Well, I think that gets into why you go in the field in the first place and make money. Mm -hmm. So, what would be an example of, of something that might be on a handout? Something that you might give to them and say, "Here, you know this." Let's talk about this. There are some things on this handout that I think would be really helpful. What would be an example of one of those handouts? Well, one of the ones I give very early on would be the alternatives to self-injury. All right. And that's something I originally got off of a website, and I don't think palace.net is even around anymore because I came across this handout well over 10 years ago. Oh, probably going on 12 now. Mm-hmm. And and I've tweaked it because some of the recommendations, the alternatives were not appropriate and some things I've added in that I thought worked. Uh-huh. But the thing I liked about it is it broke it down by what was the trigger. So if you're feeling sad, depressed, here's a list of things you can do to help 
pick up your spirits. If you're angry, ticked off, well, instead of taking it on your body, this is how you can get out of the anger. And that could be ripping up a notebook. It could be, I tell people, well, go dig a hole in the backyard. I mean, <laughs> you know, an appropriate hole and permission and all that, all those little disclaimers. Uh-huh. But it's really about redirecting all of that pent up energy, all of that physical energy that seems to focus mostly on the hands and the forearms Mm -hmm. and redirecting it, displacing it out of the body and into the ground, into the shovel, into the notebook or or whatever, because it's about trying to get that uh, parasympathetic nervous system kicked in, that calming part Mm -hmm. versus the uh, the sympathetic, which is like kicking in all of the like, ah, cortisol and adrenaline and all this emotion and energy that's got to get out. Uh And I'm a huge believer in exercise. Mm. Uh, Exercise is medicinal. Exercise helps you psychologically and physiologically. Mm -hmm. Uh, And actually, I just posted a YouTube video about how exercise is medicinal on several levels. But uh, another activity might be, let's say, if they need more of a mindfulness thing. Uh-huh. And this was one off that handout. And they said, you know, put a raisin in your mouth and really focus in on the texture of the raisin, mm. the taste of it. I mean, really just get caught up in that moment. Uh-huh. And I tell them, you, go outside, go stare at the grass, really pay attention to everything that's going on in that little one inch square of do you see the little ants? Do you see the striations of the grass? Do you see the little bits of grains of dirt? And just really get focused in on something else. Mm. But, of course, they can text me. They can call me uh, as other options or call a friend. Mm -hmm. It's really about redirecting the energy out of the hands into something productive. And that could be knitting, I've had knitters huh. before, and there are ones that are specific for skin picking uh-huh. that I recommend. But it is just really trying to get to that, that core, what was the trigger, and here are some alternatives that might help redirect that particular energy. But then we also focus a lot on, so how are we going to do with the trigger next time? Mm-hmm. And I'll often say it's about live, learn, and move on. Mm-hmm. So part, some of this, what you're talking about, is um, it's sort of like a, a method of distraction uh, and a method of displacement, of displacing your feelings into alternative um, activities that don't pose harm to oneself. And those sound great. And um, the terminology you're using, once again, that, you know, a lot of those addiction terminology things, uh, you know, the triggers, and I imagine that much like in the addiction field that you can have relapses in this case, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And it's very important how you handle the relapse. And it, because they're already going to beat themselves up for it, it people that self-harm already tend to have a real low self-esteem. Uh-huh. They tend to feel bad because they know what they're doing isn't good. They know people are judging them already. And... Even the ones that claim that their self-esteem isn't bad, there's still this, it doesn't match up an incongruence of, if you love yourself, then you wouldn't harm your body. Right. But for those that, that do struggle with a lot of the guilt issues, and that's a trigger, I need to punish myself, I disappointed people, I'm such a loser, mm-hmm. I mean, just fill in the blank. To come at them with a relapse and act disappointed or to get angry, or go, well, you're just never going to quit, are you? And all of these judgments, it's the last thing they need. It's going to trigger them to do it again. So I handle it more of the, okay, well, you know, let's talk about it. And it's pretty casual, just like that, of just, well, sure, tell me what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what can we learn from this? And if they've used some of the alternatives, if they tried the delay technique, if they tried to phone a friend, if they tried to knit, if they tried anything, to me, I see that as a win Mm -hmm. because they made an effort to move forward in their recovery. And that gets lost a lot of times. 
Sure. It, you can't do all or nothing with self-injury. Lori, do you use the term recovery with your uh, clients? I sort of yes and no. Sometimes they use it, uh-huh. but it sometimes I'll I'll say, well, you know what? It's it, you are well, and I guess I'll back up and say, I don't think you ever really recover uh-huh. from self harm because I'll remind them that yes, you've gone a year. This is awesome. You should feel really good about yourself. Yeah, you had a major milestone, but I also remind them. But don't take it for granted. Uh huh. Never assume that you can't go back there. Right. And I don't want them obsessing, going, "Oh my gosh, am I going to relapse? Am I going to ah?" And where they think themselves into. It. But at the same time, I've had people that have gone ten years in between episodes, and then the perfect storm came along, mm. and they relapsed. Oh man. And I've had <clears throat> many of those cases of adults that they go, "Yeah, I did as a teenager, and now I'm in my thirties." Mm-hmm. And I I relapsed. I didn't think I could do that. But that's where I get into a lot of the self-care and daily practices and weekly practices of you need to be doing these things. And if you keep this stuff in line, you keep this straight, you greatly reduce the likelihood that you're going to relapse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's giving it them never, That's giving them the tools, isn't it? Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's never getting so cocky to go, oh, I'll never go back to, because you can never say never when right. you've done behavior and when it's been ingrained in you. Mm-hmm. So what are the challenges in working with these types of clients, Lori? Sometimes it's their parents. Um, <laughs> okay. Especially, you know, if we're looking at adolescent population, uh-huh. uh, the parents can be enablers. All right. Parents can be... Uh, just so disconnected, they can have, and a lot of times parents have their own mess of issues that they're not dealing with. Mm-hmm. So the adolescent or the young adult might be the identified patient, but as we know, they didn't just one day wake up that way. There's a whole bunch of learning that took place in the process. Mm-hmm. And those can be some of the, the challenges or uh, let's say if they've made this their identity and they're at school and they're hanging out with people that accept them because they do the same behavior and now you're asking them to stop that behavior right. and they have a huge fear of then where are my friends? Who will I hang out with? I'm going to be back to square one yeah, again. Yeah, then what? Yeah. yeah, and those are a lot of challenges that we work through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... Yeah, and I imagine so with adolescents, part of what you're doing is it's not only focusing, you know, specifically on the behavior, but some of the elements behind that. And I guess for adolescents, that would be identity development. Yes, it it definitely is working on where healthy uh, examples should come from, Mm -hmm. having healthy friends, healthy relationships. Uh, and again, a lot working on those Bill of Rights, working on how to be assertive, not be a people pleaser, but not be so emotionally cut off that you're in the desert. Right. Finding balance, because life is about balance, and I'll keep taking them back to that. Of mm-hmm. When we go to extremes, bad stuff happens. Right. But we focus uh, quite a bit on those coping skills, those core issues, because Self-injury, just like an eating disorder and substance use and promiscuity and gambling and all the rest, those are just the acting out behaviors. Those are just the things that we see. They're the surface Mm -hmm. stuff. You always have to get to the deeper issues. And people that focus solely on the behavior, they're really missing it. Uh Oh, great. Yeah, they've stopped their eating disorder, but now they've switched to something else because you didn't address the core issue. Right. It's sort of like that analogy of the iceberg, isn't it? That the behaviors would just be on the surface, but you know what what underlies all of that, which mm-hmm. kind of gets which kind of gets back. You know, one of the things is what's the function of the behavior and and all that kind of stuff. Well, Lori, this last part of the interview is what I call um, make a mental note, and it's where I have my guests just talk about general tips or 
or words of wisdom for the audience, things that they can do to improve their mental health or their mental wellness. Do you have any tips or words of wisdom for the uh, audience along these lines? Well, I really try to advocate for what I call the trifecta of self-care. All right. That's sleep, nutrition, and exercise. Okay. Keep those three things in check. When you're regularly doing them, life is a lot more manageable. Sleep will sometimes dictate your nutrition. Your nutrition is going to dictate your energy level to exercise. Exercise is going to influence your ability to sleep. So you can either have it go in a positive direction or when one gets off kilter, it's a domino effect and everything starts to crash and then that's where you can really spiral into mental health issues and also physiological issues. Mm -hmm. That's, and, that's, mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Oh, and that's where it's, and with that, I have two side parts of the social aspect and also the spiritual, and those are like the, the balances with that trifecta. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, that's great. And, you know, there have been so many guests that have mentioned these things about the importance of, uh, of sleep and nutrition and, and exercise. And, and hopefully, if you're a regular listener if, uh, of, of the Make a Mental Note podcast um, and you're not doing these things, hopefully this, this is uh, starting to sink in about uh, how professionals really view this as important uh, for mental wellness. So, and it's cer certainly something that uh, I don't take for granted. So, well, Lori, if there's anybody who is interested, maybe a client or a parent uh, who is interested in contacting you for clinical services, how could they get a hold of you? And then also, how could uh, practitioners or parents get a hold of your books? Well, uh, one way is can just directly email me at lori at lorivan.com, and it's L-O-R-I at L-O-R-I-V-A-N-N.com. Okay. And my website is lorivancounseling.com. Uh, but you can also find me on social media. On Twitter, I'm at lorivanlpcs. Uh, YouTube is very similar. YouTube channel is lorivanlpcs. Okay. And for the books, um, you can look to Amazon because a caregiver's guide to self-injury and a practitioner's guide to the treatment of self-injury tips, uh, activities, techniques, and debates, uh, that's also available and on my website, too, under the shop page. And uh, the third book that I wrote, the activity workbook for self-injury, that's only available for the the intensive training that I do for practitioners. And there's one coming up that will be in Mexico, in Playa de Carmen, in early December. Ah. And that's for practitioners. They, they want the nitty-gritty. They want the full training on injury, uh, access to that activity workbook, and also 75 minutes of consult time uh, with me and they can contact me for the details on that because there's still a few spots left open for it. Okay. What a, what a bunch of great resources there. And, and uh, we'll make sure and put all of this into the show notes. So if anybody wants to get a hold of you or uh, get your books or perhaps sign up for the training, that they can do so. Well, Lori, thanks, uh, thanks so much for being a part of this podcast interview today. I, I learned a lot about uh, non-suicidal self-injury, and I'm sure the listeners did too. And um, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. You too. Okay. All right. I appreciate Lori coming on the Make a Mental Note podcast today to share her expertise. And, uh, you know, I know I've mentioned this before, but I feel so, so honored, so lucky to be able to talk to these experts, you know, just, just to be able to pick their brains about things and to learn. And uh, because, you know, I, I sincerely believe that um, healing comes through learning, learning about ourselves, learning about these, these different topics, these different areas. So I really appreciate her coming on the podcast today. Here's my mental notes takeaway. Non-suicidal self-injury is a coping strategy that, that some people use to deal with emotional distress. Their intention isn't to commit suicide, but rather to find a way of releasing emotional pain. Now here's my question. What are the trauma backgrounds of clients who engage in non-suicidal self-injury? 
Lori mentioned that people who engage in these behaviors may have experienced physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, as well as neglect. And in fact, about 70% of the clients in Lori's outpatient practice have a history of emotional abuse. And um, she mentioned that about uh, 50% suffered from physical abuse, while 30% experienced sexual abuse. So if you're a helping professional or a prospective helping professional, it makes sense to ask about traumatic experiences when talking to clients about their histories. Okay, you can get the show notes for today's podcast episode on my website, chrisquarto.com. And make sure and subscribe to the podcast series using an app. As I've mentioned numerous times, my favorite app is Downcast. And thanks so much for listening to the Make a Mental Note podcast. And have a great rest of the week. Mm-hmm.